many UFO sightings are easily explained. Yet when more than one person claims to see the same object at the same time, from different vantage points, the reports become harder to dismiss. Hudson County, New Jersey, the town of North Bergen, a middle-class suburb across the river from New York City. Its residents are hard-working, educated professionals who tend to be realists. This is also a place where there have been persistent claims of alien and UFO sightings. George Obarski owned a Manhattan liquor store and drove the same route back to his home in North Bergen, New Jersey, every night for decades. At 3 a.m. on the morning of January 12, 1975, as he was driving through the local park, his radio reception suddenly became distorted. He related the subsequent events to UFO investigator Bud Hopkins, who recorded his story with a portable tape recorder. Well, I would say that that thing was 30 feet across. Mm -hmm. It was a big thing. Yeah. And uh, it, it seemed to be, I would say, maybe six feet high. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like a pancake. Yeah. It was blown up in the, yeah. like, a, like a pancake. Right. And, and the thing landed right ahead of me. He described small figures who got out. He said they looked like kids in snowsuits, and they were each one carrying a kind of a, a squarish uh, receptacle and a long spoon-like shovel. They dug soil samples extremely quickly, spooning up the dirt, put it in the little satchels, and got back in the craft. He said they moved incredibly fast, like kids coming down a fire escape, and the thing took off. He was absolutely terrified, stunned. He didn't know what he was seeing. Even after George Obarski made it home, he was still shaken, terrorized by what he had encountered. I was scared to death. Yeah. You know, I was, I was sweating. And I immediately made some tea. Boy, after that, I turned on this radio and took two aspirins. Hey, you know, I was, I was scared. Right. Oh, man, it just me that I'm going crazy. There's something awful wrong with George Obarski died in 1990. His son, Frank, remembers his father's story well. What he described was a, a big saucer-like uh, object, uh, which for want of any better explanation, you'd have to call a UFO, unidentified flying object, that came down, was sort of disc-like on the bottom, had very strange lighting, sort of glowed. The clincher was, after it landed, my father, described himself as being basically frozen, almost in fear. And this is a guy who'd been robbed a lot in the liquor store in New York and knew what fear was like and had coped with it a lot. But he, was, he said he was genuinely frightened of this thing. Bud Hopkins tried to corroborate George Obarski's story with other witnesses, including a doorman who worked at the Stonehenge apartment building across the street from the park. I realized it was a big apartment building there, so I spent weeks trying to locate the doorman. I called him and I remember my <laughs> adrenaline rushing when this man said, I will never forget it, this flying saucer came down and landed in the park, and I watched the thing come down. Then he started describing what it looked like, and it was a, an identical description to George. After writing about Obarski's story in the Village Voice newspaper, Bud Hopkins kept looking for other possible witnesses. One family came to light afterwards. They were living about five blocks away, seeing this object coming down the street, maybe uh, 40 feet up, slanted. And they described it as if it was looking in their windows. Uh, and even though the woman in the family was ill, um, she, she ran outside in her nightgown, bare feet, and uh, the father and the children ran out, and they followed this thing down the street. A North Bergen school teacher, Ann Karlovich, says she listened skeptically as her daughters described the telltale evidence in the park on the day after the alleged incident. Back in 1975, uh, we had heard about this incident that there was uh, a flying saucer in the park. So my daughter and her friends went down to the park to see what was going on and they all kept running back saying they saw rings and burn marks in the grass uh, in the field down near the softball field. And uh, they told me the whole story about broken windows, that the Stonehenge had a large glass facade and it was broken by a beam of light that hit it. The kids were awfully excited about it. Frank Obarski also went to the site with his father. 
He knew him as a practical man, so it was difficult for him to understand why his dad held to such a seemingly irrational story. He didn't show much interest in things that couldn't be proved or disproved or that didn't apply to everyday life. And this was one of those categories that he felt didn't apply to everyday life. So I had a lot of trouble reconciling my knowledge of my father with this story he was telling me. He said, uh, you know, I've lived a long life as honorably and truthfully as I was able to. And he said, a man doesn't do that for over 70 years and then throw it all away by making up some foolishness. The North Bergen area had a history of UFO claims prior to Obarski's alleged alien sighting. And the reports are still coming in. Since the alleged sighting made famous by George Obarski in 1975, residents of North Bergen, New Jersey, have reported seeing dozens of UFOs on a number of different occasions. In the early evening of July 6th, 1986, Wall Street investor Ron Lee and artist Nanetta Nappi were enjoying the sunset on her terrace in the Stonehenge apartment complex. I just said, what the heck is that? Out in the sky, I was just staring out and I saw something that was unidentifiable to me. And Nanetta and I looked at it and it wasn't moving. It didn't have any sound. And we just followed it with our eyes and tried to guess what, what that could be. Had it had a motor sound to it, I would not have been suspicious, but the fact that it was so silent and large, it was a large-shaped object, it drew my attention even further. I might have just ignored it. It was oval, and it had two, three sets of lights underneath it. And it just kept stationary in the sky for five, ten minutes, and then at some point, it just took off and went south in a fashion without gaining momentum, but just going straight off with uh, accelerated speed uh, beyond what I was used to seeing. And shortly after that, very shortly, we saw, we heard noise and, and then saw military aircraft following it. The next day, sightings of this UFO were reported in the press. Nanetta was not one of the people who had called the local officials. Now you don't want to talk about things that people could think that you're a little strange thinking about it. I was in denial about it because um, I didn't want to accept or believe um, that this thing was, um, did not have a rational reason behind it. Two years later in the same area of New Jersey, disc jockey Dave D'Elia claims he witnessed an unidentified flying object on St. Patrick's Day in 1988 over North Hudson Park. D'Elia says he was driving home when he noticed something in the sky. He pulled over. As I'm standing there, it's getting closer and closer. No noise at all. But the lights that made up the triangle were white. I mean, the, the diamond were white and green. D'Elia returned to his car and followed the UFO down the parkway for several miles, noting the shape of the craft. The shape of the UFO was a diamond shape like this. Where my thumbs are was basically the part that was coming toward me. That's how it was flying. In 1993, five years after D'Elia's reported 1988 sighting, another North Bergen resident, Ann Karlovich, who had been skeptical of the earlier Obarski sighting, claimed she too was an eyewitness to an unidentified flying object. I saw this very kind of a elliptical shaped large light shining and I looked at it and I said, gee, wow, what is that? And it, was, it seemed to be moving very slowly, but I wasn't sure. And then as I turned my car around, it was gone. So um, I came into the house and my son-in-law and daughter were here. And I said to Joe, my son-in-law, I said, wow, did I see something strange on Boulevard East? And he said, I saw it too. It had a uh, sort of eerie glow. It looked uh, metallic and was, was very well lit, like with a, a fluorescent, bright um, flood kind of light. As I recall it to be a, a blimp-like object, um, like an elongate, like an ellipse, you know, elliptical sphere, if you will. 
Joe Bass remembers reading the next day in the local newspaper that all the blimps in the area had been grounded due to foggy weather. I know what it wasn't. I know that it wasn't some sort of uh, uh, lights on the clouds or a meteor or anything like that. I suspect it was either some kind of government aircraft, some Air Force kind of aircraft that they don't let on that they have an aircraft of this type. It wasn't a plane, it wasn't a helicopter, it was like a, a blimp type object. It is quite clear that people in this area believe they are seeing UFOs. But are they alien spacecraft? Since World War II, reports of UFO sightings have grown to merit a system of classification, a way to categorize people's claims. This method was developed by an astronomy professor at Northwestern University, J. Allen Hynek. It was he who coined the phrase, close encounter of the third kind, to describe human contact with an alien. Philip Imbrogno collaborated with Hynek on his final book in 1987. They collected accounts of East Coast sightings, which Imbrogno says number into the thousands. As I began to investigate more cases, I began to realize that I was just touching the tip of the iceberg. Actually, over in a period of five years, there were 7,000 sightings. Now, they were made by people who are pillars in the community. Police officers, pilots, lawyers, educators, scientists, executives from major corporations all saw an object that they considered to be larger than a football field flying overhead. Psychologist Hubert Dolezal maintains that UFO believers are mistaken in what they think they are seeing. What we're looking at is a perceptual phenomenon where the background information is either dark conditions or dust conditions and where there's very little visual structure against which the object appears. Add to that the question of does this person have uh, myopia, nearsightedness, and astigmatism, uh, suffers from any other kind of visual defect, and now you're looking at the question of not only unidentified uh, moving objects, but unidentified stationary objects. I know what I saw. That's the only thing I can say. I know I saw something that didn't look like anything else I had seen before. Syndicated columnist Sally Deering grew up in the North Bergen area. She's heard dozens of the local UFO stories, and she thinks any belief in aliens and UFOs is ridiculous. They jump to UFO. You know, uh, and I think they jumped to that too quickly. You know, there's a lot of ways you could explain a lot of the, these things that we see. And I think that people just want to believe, you know, they'll go from A to alien before they'll go to A to B. And I remember back in the early 70s how we would read books, you know, Robert Heinlein's uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, Kurt Vonnegut's uh, books. And we would accept uh, science fiction as some kind of metaphor for uh, what we were living in at the time. You know, we, uh, this sort of feeling of out being outcast in a society. Are alienated people confusing science fiction with reality? According to Professor Dolezal, those who claim to see aliens and UFOs may be experiencing a psychological need to be a part of a trend, something bigger than themselves, thus latching on to observations which have little or no supporting evidence. What I do believe is going on it's the proverbial bandwagon effect, that it's popular to be included and to be part of this. Uh, it is becoming more and more accepted. The onus of you're nuts or there's something wrong with your brain or uh, you're a liar is, has been vastly decreased. I think people are more open to the possibility. I believe every human being wants to be part of something that is special, that is important, that is exciting. Certainly with the advent of human beings becoming more sophisticated in terms of space travel, our own yearnings to be in space and, and to populate other planets, I think all of that has fueled, and reasonably so, this entire belief system and movement. Although skeptics like Professor Dolezal give compelling reasons why people think they see things which are not really there, Believers remain irritated by the general skepticism they encounter. Franco Barsky is still perplexed by his father's alleged experience. It really bothered him that, that people thought he was lying about this. 
And that's the thing that I find the most compelling about, about this whole story and the thing that I have the most trouble with. Is I suppose it is frightening because it's the unknown. You know, things that are not really part of the known are frightening.